Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. Imagine that you're in the position to completely end the monarchy in Great Britain by condemning the last king in the line of the throne to death. Well, our story today actually is the true story behind this scenario, and for the Connecticut twist, what happened during the getaway after the deposed king's son regained the throne and ordered them caught for likely execution. That's right, the two of them came to hide out in none other than Connecticut. Chris Pagliuco is the author of the book The Great Escape of Edward Whaley and William Goff. It is a true story. He's the 8th grade social studies teacher and curriculum coordinator for the Madison Public Schools. He's going to be along in a minute with this unbelievable story. This week's trivia question, what's blue and white and red all over? Stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to ynhhs.org. That's ynhhs.org. In order to put this week's episode into the right context, we've got to take a quick look back into British history in the 1600s. Those were the years, you may recall, when the Puritans left England for North America on the Mayflower. Well, then after that, the same religious and political disputes that drove the Puritans away led to three separate civil wars in England. Finally, the unthinkable happened. The British monarchy itself was toppled. King Charles I was captured, tried, and executed. And all this led to a new Puritan-led government. Well, that government only lasted about 10 years before the son of King Charles I, Charles II, returned the monarchy to its former state of glory and regained power. So what's all this have to do with Connecticut history? Well, there were 59 men who sealed the fate of Charles I, It was very dramatic. They left their fingerprint on his death ward and signed their name next to it. And two of those 59 decided to get out of England and come to New England. That's because Charles II generally struck a chord of harmony across the land, but he really felt quite differently about the 59 men who had sent his dad to the gallows. The two jurors who came to New England were Edward Whaley and William Goff. They sailed first to Boston, but eventually ended up in New Haven. Now, Whaley and Goff were remarkably skillful military leaders during England's civil wars. In fact, they never lost a battle. It was a remarkable string of successes. But with Charles II now condemning the jurors to be drawn and quartered and disemboweled, Whaley and Goff knew that they had to get out of England. Chris Pagliuco is the author of The Great Escape of Edward Whaley and William Goff. He taught history at Madison High School for 20 years and now teaches 8th graders while organizing the history curriculum for grades K through 8. He's also the former town historian for the town of Essex. During the story today, we're going to use a word we don't normally use, regicide. It means killing a king. And regicides are those who are responsible for killing the king. And that's what Whaley and Goff were considered to be. Now, also, Chris will tell you in his book some of the stories attributed to Whaley and Goff carry the word purportedly. Because as he likes to put it, the stories are consistent with the legend, but maybe not otherwise entirely verifiable. Tell me about Whaley and Goff, where they came from, and who they were. I think they were pretty much a couple of very minor businessmen. The records from what I was able to find are pretty patchy. They were definitely pretty insignificant individuals in terms of their civilian life prior to the war. They really distinguished themselves on the battlefield, and really they never lost a battle. William Goff in particular was viewing the success on the battlefield 
as a sign that God wanted the parliamentarians to win. Increasingly, as he grew more and more exasperated with Charles and his negotiations and his efforts to keep his plight alive, William Goff was instrumental in referring to Charles as a man of blood. After the first civil war, there had been basically a bunch of negotiations, and it finally got to the point everybody really had it out for Charles. So after the second civil war, it turns out that they're going to capture Charles I and put him on trial, which was unprecedented in monarchy history in the world at that point in time. It's a really staggering story, and it's a momentous story. It's filled with drama, but it really has a lot to do with contributing to the birth of democracy, and the original patriots were keenly aware of that. Charles II at first comes in and seems somewhat forgiving, except for the people who actually signed the death warrant against his father. So now Whaley, Goff, and others who had signed that warrant were now in the crosshairs, and they decide that they're going to make the very difficult decision of leaving their home country and going over to North America. So when they do that, they look over and they see these various colonies, and one, I guess, stuck out, the one in New Haven. New Haven was probably, I think it's pretty well accepted as being the most Puritan of all the New England colonies, and these were like referred to as the Bible Commonwealths. They were certainly founded with completely different motivations and by different people than you would find in the Mid-Atlantic and Southern colonies. The regicides first arrived in Massachusetts Bay, and they were largely paraded around the colony as some of the most prominent men to ever visit the colonies. They shared a common faith, and they shared common political views. They ended up traveling to New Haven, one, because New Haven was like-minded, but also it wasn't a major entry point, less populated location than certainly Boston and New York were, and they would have a degree of protection in the New Haven colony. There's one story we have to tell, which is the uh, one of Goff, and a uh, gentleman has come into town and is challenging everybody to a fencing match. Can you tell us that story? Right. So there's a lot of stories in this related to Whaley and Goff's time in New England. In the book, I use the word purported because they're really a form of legend or myth. It's hard to tell degrees of truth. Nevertheless, this particular story celebrates some of the attributes of these guys that New Englanders admired. And so in this case, William Goff and Edward Whaley, you know, of course, they're master military tacticians and trained and have been through close to 10 years of warfare and so forth. This man is challenging people to fencing contests. So he challenges William Goff and William Goff doesn't let him know his identity and so forth. And William Goff ends up threatening the man. He's like, be careful who you're challenging. The man's none the wiser to who his opponent is. And William Goff grabs like a mop and a bucket and the man comes at him and he's able to swipe the sword away and brush the mop right up in his face and humiliate the man who was challenging him. Now, when Goff and Whaley are in Massachusetts, they're pretty open. Everybody knows who they are. They're out there. They're kind of celebrated as heroes. They're the highest ranking people to visit the new colonies from England. So they're kind of stars at that point in time. And then word started to trickle over that Charles II was very serious in issuing warrants for their arrest and offering rewards for anybody who would bring him in dead or alive. And suddenly, these new colonies, which operated under charters from the king, are starting to think, huh, you know, if we protect them, we're at risk. And so it's against this backdrop that Whaley and Goff now have to decide to go to New Haven. That's kind of what drove them out, right? Yeah. New Haven was less prominent of a location. They would have been far less visible in New Haven. New Haven appears to have welcomed the men with open arms. Now we have a situation where it starts to get what I would term a little bit more serious. And the royalists have 
two people appointed by uh, Governor Endicott in Massachusetts, a guy named uh, Thomas Kirk and Thomas Kellon, who are now emboldened to go around the colonies and search for Whaley and Goff with the idea that if they catch them you know, and they're alive, they'll bring them back to England and put them on trial. And this starts a series of searches around Connecticut colony, the New Haven colony. What was that like? Well, you know, it was really, really intense. And it had larger implications for the colonies as a whole. It was very political. You had to be careful how you played your cards. While there were many people who were sympathetic, there were rewards for these men's capture. And there would certainly be massive personal benefit to figuring out a way to turn these guys in or providing that information. There would also be massive penalty if you were caught aiding these guys. So the stakes were very high. Many of the colonies, such as New Haven, Plymouth, and Rhode Island, they needed to get new charters from Charles II. Those new charters would contain all sorts of provisions that many of the New England colonies were fighting over. And the most obvious one would be the borders of the colony. So many people, for instance, don't know that for, I suspect, several decades, Long Island was actually part of Connecticut. And Connecticut was hoping to acquire portions, if not all, of Rhode Island. So if your colony wasn't viewed favorably, then you could face real penalties. And that's really what happened, especially with New Haven. Is It wasn't the sole reason why things turned out the way that they did, but a contributing factor, which has been historically documented, is that New Haven was out of favor and was placed under or combined with Connecticut Colony based in Hartford because of New Haven's perceived stubbornness, which I think is pretty well accepted when it came to dealing with the regicides. Now, Whaley and Goff, when they first get there, stay at John Davenport's guest house, and he was the lead religious figure in the New Haven Colony and really sort of the spiritual leader there. And as word starts to trickle out that they're wanted, they move across the street for 14 days to a guy's house named William Jones. And then the first of three stays occurs at something that Whaley and Goff called Providence Hill, which today we call West Rock, you know, just north of New Haven. What was there and what did they do? Up on the top of West Rock, there was a good vantage point and you could see Long Island Sound. And there were some glacial erratics, which still remain on essentially at the summit of West Rock. Today, and really for the last several hundred years, that location has been celebrated as Judge's Cave. That destination today is a symbol of the hardship that the men endured for the sake of standing up for liberty against the king. Now, there was a gentleman named Sperry who owned some land at the base of the hill, and he and his sons used to bring food up to them? Yeah, right. And that was a family legend that was passed down to the president of Yale, who was doing research on the regicides just about 100 years later. If I recall, they didn't really want to meet with the regicides. They instead would leave off the food at a particular location, and then the men would come and pick it up. And in that way, they would be able to tell the truth and avoid legal punishment if it came to that. Now, as long as we're talking about great stories, isn't there one about a mountain lion? Yeah, that they, um, <laughs> they were staying in Judge's Cave. It's a very, very small cave. It's not square, that's for sure, but 10 feet by 10 feet or something, enough to provide shelter from the elements if you needed. On their last visit, they were visited by a mountain lion, and that was it for them. They, they went running down the hill, and they, they never returned to Judge's Cave after that. I can't say I blame them. Now, after this first day, you know, when I was first reading your book, I'm thinking, oh, they're feeling guilty. They're going to turn themselves in, and they decide they're going to go down to New Haven and surrender themselves and they go and they make their presence known and say, look, we just want a little time to ourselves and we're going to go to church on Sunday. And what happened after that? They made themselves known in an effort to clear people's names so that it didn't appear that there was any malfeasance going on. Instead of turning themselves in, they make a run for it. They're trying to throw off Kirk and Kellogg, their pursuers. And then 
go from there to the west to Milford. And I guess here they're also trying to sort of throw them off in terms of where they're staying and how they're getting to certain places. And they stayed in a house in the basement with some girls spinning yarn above them and singing some song that had come over from England. Can you tell us that story? They were below and supposedly the girls didn't hear the story and they're singing these lyrics that are depicting Whaley Goff and some of the other regicides in a negative light and they're sort of getting a good chuckle about that. Now what we do know for a fact though is that they wrote back and forth to their families so they must have had some connections to get those letters through without being caught. As soon as these guys are wanted by the crown, they're essentially fugitives. And so it's going to be really hard. They're not going to want anything on record. And they don't want to implicate anybody by name. And they want to sort of be like ghosts. They don't want anybody to know where they were staying. They want to be off the record, so to speak. At the same time, there are hints of what their existence was like. Some of those hints come in the form of letters that still survive to their families back in England. They definitely missed England, and they did hope to return. They also showed a degree of prosperity. They mentioned they were like trading with Indian tribes. They even stopped asking for money at one point when they were in Massachusetts because they were making so much money from their trading business. So eventually, Charles II, and I should say along the way, obviously there are some people who are trying to cash in on turning uh, these gentlemen in, and there's just enough support for them that they aren't ever turned in officially. But at one point, it just, I guess, the uh, heat in the kitchen got a little too hot, and they decided to leave the greater New Haven area, and head up to Hadley, Massachusetts, and kind of explain what Hadley was like at the time, how young it was, and and what they found there. Well, it was certainly a frontier town. One neat thing about Hadley is that you can visit it today, and they have this really pristine green that is about a mile long, and it's in its original dimensions and the walking paths on both sides of the green and the trees and the old family houses are on both sides. And it's just this classic New England town. Right in the middle of the green is where the house of the minister was and they were living with the minister for a decade or so. That is really where they spent most of their time and were most secure and so forth. And like you say, this is where they were able to sort of trade with the Native Americans, make some money. But uh, as time goes on, so does the aging process. And apparently it was at this point that Edward Whaley passed away. What do we know about that? In William Goff's letters home, he was talking about Edward Whaley's condition deteriorating and how he was really turning into a caretaker uh, something along the lines of that he was feeding him and sort of like a form of hospice care. But he doesn't mention exactly when Edward Whaley passes. Whaley would have been in his 70s, perhaps, and Goff would have been significantly younger and been able to continue on. The Hadley experience was interesting on a whole bunch of fronts, but not the least of which is this fabulous legendary story about the angel of Hadley. Can you tell us about that? This last legend seems to contain more specifics and substance than the others. The New England frontier, but really all of New England for that matter, was involved in King Philip's War in the 1670s. And this was a, really the second, it's commonly referred to as Indian Wars in American history. There isn't any record of an attack or a battle taking place in Hadley, but tradition holds that Native Americans were set to attack the town of Hadley, and everybody was all holed up together in like a defensive position. It was a surprise attack, and out of nowhere comes this really elderly man with a long white beard swirling a sword above his head. He merges out of nowhere to everybody's surprise because nobody knew who he could possibly be. And he's able to rally the townspeople and get the cannon and fire the cannon off and repel the native attack. And that largely fits into the narrative of 
King Philip's War. It was the right time. It was the right location. Nobody would have ever wanted to admit that they knew that William Goff was living in their town. And so they would make up, he was an angel. It, it wasn't a regicide, of course. It was an angel. When you think about this great escape, I think about some modern movies, literally the great escape. It's, it's sort of like an ancient 400-year-old version of that happening, and it's amazing how they got away with it. As the years preceding the American Revolution were approaching, and this was pretty much 100 years after, after the events took place, loyalists to the crown and colonists who were against the crown, they argued about whether the story of Whaley and Goff suggests that their ancestors were really loyal to the crown or really rebellious. On the side of loyalty, they said, well, look, Whaley and Goff, they were not welcome in New England and had to remain in hiding for 20 plus years. They could never live out in the open. So clearly the colonists were all very loyal to the crown because otherwise these men wouldn't have been in hiding for so long. Conversely, the colonists who were against the crown said, no, the fact that we were able to successfully hide these men for such a long duration and keep these things secret shows the loyalty of the everyday person. And it shows how against the crown the bulk of the populace was. I mean, this was a really hard secret to keep, and they were successfully able to do it. wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. We don't know precisely when Edward Whaley and William Goff died or where they're buried, but they did manage to avoid the hangman's noose, in part by hiding out in Hamden's Judge's Cave on West Rock, a cave you can visit yourself. And as for the British monarchy, well, it's doing just fine. This story was about Charles I and Charles II, and Yes, of course, we now have Charles III on the throne in London some 350 years later. I also want to thank our guest for today's program, Chris Pagliuco. He's the author of the book, The Great Escape of Edward Whaley and William Goff. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, what's blue and white and red all over? The answer, well, it's those blue and white town history signs that are read by people all over the state. Next week, we're going to feature the person who spent a dozen years traversing the state to take pictures of each one and then publish them in a book with some info so you and I can learn more about our state. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. (laughs) 